Can you explain what happened in Texas this weekend? I think that the heroics of Texas Democrats maybe overshadow what is the most likely eventuality there, which is my understanding that the law will eventually pass. Is that right? Probably, yeah. I think that that's, that's most likely. So what happened in Texas is that the legislative session was coming to a close and the Republicans wanted to jam this uh, this terrible voter suppression law through in the closing hours, literally in the middle of the night of Memorial Day weekend. So obviously it wasn't a bill they were too proud of because they weren't looking to champion it when people were paying attention. They were looking to jam it here at the end of session in the middle of the night. They were able to successfully do that in the state Senate on Friday night. Um, it was finally voted on at 6 a.m., uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, but when it came to go to the state house in Texas, which is more closely divided than the state Senate uh, on a partisan basis, um, it ran into a series of points of order. And then finally, uh, Democrats left and denied a quorum, which meant that there weren't enough members present to pass the bill. The session expired. And so democracy was saved for a short period of time. But it was only a short period of time because what will likely happen next is that the governor will call a special session. And in that special session, uh, I would expect that Republicans will try to repass the same bill or something substantially similar to it. Mark, the Texas law, as you said, will likely pass. Um, 14 states have enacted 22 laws that they've already passed. They're already the law. I have started to focus, and, and I know this is something you talk about a lot, on, on the pieces of the laws that disempower the kinds of people who really walked the line last November. In, in Georgia, that seems to be to strip out people like Brad Raffensperger from their role in administering elections. This Texas law lowers the standard for allegations of fraud. Can you talk about those elements of the laws and if it's true that they're becoming more brazen in, in really sort of sh shifting the deck in terms of who the referees would be in a future contested, this wasn't even a contested contest, a future case where, where an incumbent president refuses to accept the results. Yeah, so I think they're doing two things and it's important to keep them separate because they're both really, really important. The first is they're trying to intimidate the ref, right? So they're doing a whole bunch of stuff, passing laws that have basically put criminal liability in many instances, but liability either civil or criminal on election officials for basically doing their jobs. So they are banning election officials from helping people to vote, providing uh, information, sending out absentee ballot applications. They're doing a whole bunch of stuff to basically try to intimidate election officials from being voter centric and being helpful in the process. The second, though, is what you point to, which is that they're also looking to change who is the ref so that they're replacing people who are either nonpartisan or bipartisan with people who are very partisan. So they're replacing nonpartisan or bipartisan commissions or boards of election with strict partisans in a hope that if they can't intimidate all the refs at the local level, they can ultimately replace them uh, with someone up above who will have a will have a disenfranchising and a thumb on the scale. And if all of these laws had been in place in November, or, or at least in places like Georgia and Arizona, where they're being targeted, could you see a scenario where the result would not have been a trans? We didn't have a peaceful transfer of power, but ultimately a we had a transfer of power to the person who won. Would these laws have made that an impossibility or at least a question mark if they'd been in place last November? So again, I think that there are two pieces of it. The first is the voter suppression laws. Would it have changed turnout enough? Would it have dissuaded enough voters? I don't know that we know the answer to that with any particular state in any particular election. I can tell you that close elections are decided by a matter uh, matters of centimeters, not even inches, and certainly not feet and yards. So in these close elections, every time you change the rules, every time you make it harder for a group to vote, or you, you make it less likely their ballots count, you affect outcomes of elections. But the second point that you, that you make is, who certifies elections, who administers those elections can make a big difference. And, you know, one of the statistics that or one of the facts that that I always point out um, uh, is that on on December 7th, Texas sued 
uh, uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court four states to try to throw out their election results. And 126 members of the House Republicans signed on to that brief. The evening of January 6th, after the insurrection, after the violence, 139 Republican members of the House sought to not certify the election results. So we weren't even going in the right trend between before the the insurrection and the night of the insurrection. And it is certainly the case that we are not going in the right trend moving forward. Well, and just to pick up your thread, um, I, I spent time in Republican politics. This is existential to them. They will not stop. Mm -hmm. The laws will become more aggressive. And I, and I know you've filed lawsuits in, in six states. There are 400 bills. I mean, I spoke to a Senate source who said, well, Mark Elias is suing. And I said, is that the whole Democratic strategy, Mark Elias? I mean, can you do this alone or do you need federal legislation that I believe every one of these laws would be undermined and invalidated by the federal legislation. Yeah, look, I've been very, very clear. Anyone who thinks that I, or for that matter, me and other lawyers are gonna, are gonna uh, protect democracy by ourselves uh, misunderstands the threat. This is not a question of a bad law here or a bad law there, where, the, where we can turn to lawyers and to the courts to try to fix it. What we have right now is an avalanche of voter suppression going on in state after state after state. And the only way to deal with that kind of state-sponsored disenfranchisement and state-sponsored state voter suppression is to pass federal legislation. In 1965, no one thought that lawyers alone were gonna go to court and were gonna deal with Jim Crow. Well, no one should think that that's going to be true in 2021 either. We needed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 at that time to, st to stop the disenfranchisement that was going on. And we need the For the People Act now in uh, 2021. Lawyers can do a lot. I try to play my part. But, but anyone who is telling you that we are the full solution doesn't understand the scope of the problem. And President Biden is feeling the heat on this. He, he spoke pretty frankly about it yesterday. He appointed the vice president um, to spearhead this. I'm surprised her first call wasn't to you. Um, hopefully your phone will ring as soon as you get off our air. Um, I, I wonder if you feel that they are taking this seriously enough, that, that if you think the White House understands the importance of, of this very popular president, he's a 62 percent approval rating, all of his um, agenda items are even more popular than that. Do you think he appreciates how important it is to put this front and center? Look, I think the statement he issued about Texas was excellent. And I think it showed a real understanding of how, how dire the circumstances is. And Kamala Harris has been a leader on voting rights for a very long time. No one should think that Kamala Harris was just sort of added to this topic or this problem at the last minute. You know, it was in 2020 that Kamala uh, Harris uh, introduced the uh, the Vote Safe Act, which was one of the, the the predecessors to what is now the For the People Act. And she drafted this bill that had wide support support among the civil rights organizations, among progressive organizations. Um, it it was an excellent bill. Large chunks of it are in the For the People Act, and I can think of no better person than to lead this. Uh, this charge uh, than the vice president. So I'm thrilled that she is uh, uh, a point, uh, that she's been given this task. I'm quite partial to her, as you know. I represented her, uh, her her presidential campaign. So I think I think she is a spectacular choice for this. She and the president, both former senators. Um, what do you think they should do, and what do you think they should urge? publicly and privately about the filibuster, if that is the impediment to having this legislation passed? Look, what I've said about the filibuster is this. I don't know the right mechanism. I don't know whether it's getting rid of the filibuster, it's making an exception to the filibuster, it's changing the structure of the filibuster. Here's what I know. We cannot have a, a country in which voting rights is held hostage to a rule of the Senate. I mean, I don't mean like a constitutional provision. I mean, literally a rule of the Senate. You know, the Senate rules are not a suicide pact for our democracy. And if that's what they have become, then frankly, they need to yield. The good news is that President Biden and uh, Vice President Harris are both former senators. 
and they know exactly the right levers to, to push and pull to bring the Democratic caucus to a place that they pass uh, the, the, the For the People Act. How they do that with respect to change of the rules or reforming the rules, I'll leave to them.